So this is the last video for this extraordinarily long section. I uh, hope you're still with me here. Uh, I'm gonna do two more examples for you. Uh, example number four, y equals square root of x squared minus one. Um, now the x squared minus one, there's no restrictions on the domain from that because that's a polynomial. So you look for restrictions from the square root. Well, the restrictions on the argument of the square root is that the argument has to be greater than or equal to zero because square root is index two and two is even, right? So from the previous uh, list of restrictions, we know that x squared minus one has to be greater than or equal to zero. Now don't just add one to both sides and then do a plus minus square root thing that doesn't work with inequalities, okay? Uh, so what we have to do is factor the x squared minus one. Uh, it's a difference of two squares, so it's really easy to factor. x minus one times x plus one is greater than or equal to zero. Now what you do is you solve the associated equation. This inequality, x minus one times x plus one greater than or equal to zero, does not imply that x minus one is greater than zero and x plus one is greater than zero. It doesn't imply that at all. Um, they could both be positive or they could both be negative, but you don't wanna worry about trying to figure out those cases. What you wanna do is solve the associated e equation. What that means is the same thing, but with equals instead of greater than or equal to. And that'll give you endpoints of your intervals Okay, in this case, they're gonna be x equals one and x equals minus one. And they're gonna be solid dots because it's greater than or equal to, not just strictly greater than. It's because of the equals part. So you graph them on a number line. Okay, this is how you figure out your domain for things like this, when there's an inequality involved. You graph your endpoints on the number line, minus one and one. And then you, you pick test points so that those two points divide the line into three pieces, three different intervals, one to the left of negative one, one in between negative one and one, and one to the right of one. And so you wanna pick test numbers from each interval, uh, in each of those three intervals. And I just picked negative two, zero, and two. Those are the easiest ones to pick, I think. And plug those into the inequality here the inequality, not the original equation, the inequality to see if it's greater than or equal to zero. So we call these our test points. And I would write it out exactly like this without the arrow, of course. X equals negative two colon underline. It tells me what I'm doing. I'm trying X is negative two. So I'm organizing my work here, okay? I'm gonna put negative two in here and I can see I get a negative here, negative two minus one, and I get a negative here, negative two plus one is negative. So I get negative times negative, which is positive, which is what I wanted. So you're just trying to see if you get a positive or negative number. Then I tried zero and I got here, I got minus one and here I got one, negative times positive is negative. Right, a product of an even number of negatives is positive and a product of an odd number of negatives is negative. So that's negative, which is not what I want. So I just put no. Some people just take and cross this off. It doesn't matter as long as you know that's not one you're using. That's not, the, that's not an interval that is gonna be in your solution set. Okay, so then I try two to see if this interval is in my solution set. So I try two. So I write out first that I'm trying to, and then I just plugged it in here, and I saw that I got two minus one is positive and two plus one is positive. So positive times positive is positive, right? And so that's good. So I wanna shade the, the intervals that contain two and minus two. So this one and this one. So you just shade those in. And usually you do it on the same number line. I'm just doing it on a separate number line. Uh, so that you can see what's going on, especially if you read the PDF later, you can see what happened. 
So now you just write, have to write this in interval notation. So it looks like that. Write parenthesis, negative infinity, comma, negative one, close bracket, union, open bracket, one, comma, infinity, close parenthesis. Right. So uh, final example, five. F of x equals x minus 1 over x minus 1 times x minus 3. Now, people get canceled happy, and they'll immediately cancel out the x minus 1s. You have to find the domain first before you do any cancellation or reduction or anything. That's a trick for that works for most functions. You just don't reduce before... You, so you find the domain before you do any reduction, okay? Because... So, You'll notice in this original equation here, if I plug 1 in, I get 0 over 0, which is really bad. It's not a real number, 0 over 0. So I can't have x equals 1. Neither can I have x equals uh, 3. So I have to eliminate those two points. So it's going to be, domain's going to be all real numbers except for 1 and 3. And so I put in 1 and 3 on a number line, make them open dots, because x can't be 1 and it can't be 3. And then it can be any other real number, because the numerator is a polynomial, the denominator is a polynomial, so those have no restrictions. So the only restriction is you can't divide by 0. So all the other numbers there work. I don't have to do the testing points like I did with the inequality one with the greater than or equal to zero, one, and number four. So what I do here is I just, with these open dots, it's it makes it a little easier just to put parentheses there because that kind of tells you what your intervals are going to look like. So you're going to have this interval from negative infinity to one with a parenthesis. Then you'll have a union. And then you'll have from one to three with parentheses. And then a union and then from 3 to infinity with parentheses. So the, the uh, interval notation is a little awkward, but that's how it works. And that's why you want to draw this line. One reason you want to draw the line, so you can write down the intervals correctly. And always go left to right with your intervals. Always read them left to right, then you won't get your numbers backwards, like 3 comma 1 or something crazy like that, or infinity comma 1, or infinity comma 3. I've seen that many, many times. Anyway, finally, that's the end of the lecture for that section. Go through and do a lot of problems. You, you probably want to pull up the PDF of this, unless this is all old hat for you, but it, it's supposed to be review. Um, I would recommend, regardless, just pull up the PDF of this, video, of this series of videos, and it'll be one PDF with all of these, like, 15 pages on it, because there's 15 videos. <laughs> And then you can go through those and look at them as you do practice problems to keep track of what's going on because there were so many topics in this one section. Um, and that should help you to get through the practice problems. But make sure that you know all this stuff because it's super important and it keeps coming back later. And one of the problems that people have with trig trigonometry when we get to it is that they don't understand the domain and range stuff very well. And it keeps messing them up. So... Spend some time here on this. It's well worth it.